It's one of the most intriguing locations in the world. Covered in darkness and miles underwater, this extreme environment is home to some unusual creatures and phenomena. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest oceanic trench on Earth. No wonder it's been so difficult to explore. Because of the risky conditions, people aren't able to explore this location without proper equipment. But what would happen if we threw a steel ball down there? Let's start with some basics. How did they first discover this enormously deep hole in the ocean? HMS Challenger identified it back in 1875. The ship had some pretty fancy sounding equipment for its time, but it wasn't nearly good enough to be able to fully explore the trench. Some decades later, in 1951, another ship, the HMS Challenger 2, came back to the location better equipped. The vessel featured an echo sounder and was able to take accurate measurements of what seemed to be the deepest point on the surface of our planet. If you were to look at it in 2D, you'd see the trench measures 1,500 miles in length and 43 miles in width on average. It also looks sort of like a crescent-shaped scar when you observe it from above. Nothing out of the ordinary so far, right? Well, if you were to stretch a wire from the surface of the ocean to the trench's deepest point, it would measure a staggering seven miles. If we were able to physically move Mount Everest, which is the Earth's tallest mountain, to cover the Mariana Trench, it still wouldn't be enough, falling short by about a mile. Because the Mariana Trench is so deep, it's almost completely covered in darkness, as light can barely get through to such extreme distances underwater. The temperature isn't any friendlier either, just a few degrees above freezing. But the most dangerous feature of them all is the water pressure. Right at the deepest point of the trench, the amount of pressure is about a thousand times higher than the standard atmospheric pressure. Not a lot of people ever attempted to descend into the Mariana Trench. In fact, the first organized attempt took place more than 60 years ago. It was done by Jacques Picard and Don Walsh in a submersible. They only spent about five hours on their descent and a mere 20 minutes at the bottom. Alas, they weren't able to take any pictures. Until these two scientists were able to descend, Specialists believed there was little to no chance that life could exist down there, given the conditions, most notably the extreme pressure. But while at the bottom, the submersible's floodlight caught sight of a creature. It was a very flat one indeed. As you can imagine, resources here are very scarce. What kind of creatures live down here? And how do they survive, given the harsh environment? Surprisingly, there is quite an abundance of wildlife living in the Mariana Trench. Some of these creatures fall back on chemicals to survive, like methane or sulfur, while other kinds of fish nibble at the marine life that's, well, weaker than them on the food chain. The most common creatures found here are xenophyophores, amphipods, and small sea cucumbers. Some of them adapted by hardening up their shell using aluminum harnessed from the seawater. Smaller creatures, like microbes, adapted by feeding on the chemicals emitted when the seawater hits the underwater rocks. They consider the Mariana snailfish the rock star of the area in terms of wildlife. They're small, ranging from 3 to 9 inches, translucent, and lacking any scales. But they're the top beast of prey in the area. It's no wonder some people started to believe that the ancient megalodon might still be living here. What was a megalodon, you might be wondering? It was the largest predator ever known in our planet's history. Basically, the biggest and nastiest shark ever to have lived. Scientists believe it's been extinct for quite some time, and the idea that it might still be hiding in the Mariana Trench doesn't have a lot of supporting information. The megalodon would have needed to learn to navigate in complete darkness. It would either have to be bioluminescent or evolve to have massive eyes. More so, because of its school bus-like size, the megalodon would have needed a lot to eat. Microbes and small snailfish just wouldn't have done the trick. If a steel ball were to be dropped in the trench, what would be its effect on it? Would the ball be strong enough to sustain such pressure? Let's look at the science here. If we assume it's a solid steel ball, the pressure found at the bottom of the trench wouldn't be enough to really affect it and cause permanent damage. It would take it a solid 12 minutes to reach the bottom of the ocean, though. What about the temperature? 
Well, it turns out that the difference in temperature on the surface and at the bottom of the trench is quite impressive, a difference of about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it would cause the ball to shrink a bit, but yet again, once the ball returns to the surface, it would simply come back to normal. Should the ball get stuck there? There's another interesting question to answer. Would corrosion affect it? Corrosion of steel is highly dependent on the amount of oxygen in the water. The amount of oxygen dissolved in water remains constant at depths greater than 3 miles. I'll spare you the math, but it would take more than 10,000 years for the steel ball to completely rust under the sea. I can't help but wonder though, what would it take us humans to be able to survive at such extreme depths? Let's look at what was used in the past to explore this mysterious location. A little thing called syntactic foam. Why? Because it's the only material that can both float and resist the amount of pressure found here. Without this sort of protection, our lungs would rapidly collapse here. More so, the pressure from the water would push liquid into our mouths, replacing the much needed oxygen with water. Then, there would be the much needed ability to be able to come back to the surface should anything not go as planned. One of the vessels that went for a deep dive here had 1,000 pound steel weights attached to it so it would ensure its sinkage. These weights were connected to the ship by a special type of wire that had an increased corroding time of 11 to 13 hours in seawater just in case something went wrong down there and they'd have to bounce back faster. Given the harsh conditions here, the problem of oxygen supply is really important too. Any vessel looking to descend into the Mariana Trench again would need to consider some sort of device that can recycle the air in order to reduce the amount of oxygen that needs to be transported down there. And the last, but definitely not the least of all problems, would be electricity. There surely isn't a power socket down there for you to charge your phone. So, there needs to be enough battery life to support all the necessary equipment, communication, oxygen supply, lighting devices, and so on. None of these problems seem to be quite the challenge anymore, since, as of recently, you can buy a tour of the Mariana Trench. Three lucky individuals were part of such a project back in 2020. They were submerged in a 3.5 inch thick titanium sphere. This ensured that they didn't feel any pressure changes and physiological stresses whatsoever. Each of the guests took part in an individual trip that had an estimated length of about 14 hours. The descent itself took over four hours. Once they reached the bottom, they got the chance to witness some of the most extraordinary creatures on the planet. Then it was time to start the four hour ascent back to the surface. Can you swim? Good because you're going on a journey to the deepest point of the Pacific Ocean. Now, put on your flippers. The very bottom of the Mariana Trench is awaiting. Now, get in the water. Really? Come on! All right. One foot underwater. That's the depth you can swim with no special gear like a mask. Hey, look! Must be some tourists. Or whales. Ten feet underwater. That's a little deeper than the public pools and beaches around the United States. You can see colorful fish and even photoplankton that feed on the sun's rays. 26 feet down. This is the depth at which the foundations of the floating city of Venice in Italy stand. Builders laid columns at that depth on which they later built houses and streets. 30 feet underwater. You start to feel a lot of pressure. When you're on the surface, you're under atmospheric pressure, 15 pounds per square inch. But here, at 30 feet, that pressure is doubled. All the air pockets in your body, like your lungs or ears, begin to compress from this pressure, giving you discomfort. But no worries, your organs are soft and elastic, so you can keep diving. 40 feet underwater. Oops, you're running out of air. An average person can hold their breath for 30 to 90 seconds. The current record is an incredible 24 minutes and 37 seconds. Gasp. Okay, you'll need some diving equipment to continue your descent. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tourists dive to this depth to look at reefs and corals. You don't need special skills for that, but you can't dive any deeper without training or a license. 45 feet down. Be careful. There's sharks swimming here looking for food, like you. <laughs> 
Sometimes tourists descend to this depth in a safe cage to see the sharks up close. You're better off staying away from these predators and not attracting their attention. So make sure you're not wearing any bright and shiny jewelry. Sharks love that kind of thing. 62 feet underwater. You could see the Aquarius Reef Base Lab in Florida at this depth, if you were in Florida. It's really an entire building with rooms for exploring the seafloor, accessible through a hatch. 105 feet down. You see a strange bell hanging from a chain. People used to use these things for deep diving about 400 years ago. They'd lower a bell on chains with divers inside from a ship. There was enough air inside the bell for them to breathe. That way, they could explore sunken ships with treasures. 140 feet. At this depth, you could find an entire sunken city in Qianda Lake, China. You can still see streets, houses, and temples there. 330 feet. Whoa! You almost hit a huge blue whale! How could you miss it? These guys, the size of two train cars, usually dive to that depth. Let's listen to them sing for a while. It's beautiful! Now, let's keep going. 660 feet. This is where most of the ocean life ends. Sun rays hardly penetrate any deeper into the water. Everything below are unusual fish like this angler. They have such an unusual appearance because they have to adapt to the high pressure here. 702 feet underwater. This is the last mark where you'd see a human without diving equipment. This man holds the title of the deepest man on Earth, and he's the only one who has managed to get to this depth. The water pressure on his body here was 20 times greater than that on the surface. 985 feet. Ooh, what was that sound? Whoa, that's a submarine. That's the maximum depth they can dive to. Some of them can reach speeds of 26 miles per hour. Fun fact, an ostrich can run twice as fast, but she can't swim. 1,090 feet. Say bye to this scuba diver. You won't see them any deeper than this. The world record was set in the Red Sea. It only took the diver 12 minutes to reach this depth. But it took him a whole 15 hours to return to the surface to avoid decompression sickness. So now you get an atmospheric deep diving suit. It's completely sealed, and you won't feel the insane water pressure on your body in it. 1,454 feet. If you stuck the Empire State Building in the water, its tip would be here. And all the carpet inside of it would be wet. 2,300 feet down. The water pressure here is 70 times greater than on the surface. The flexible plastic parts of your suit can't withstand that kind of pressure. So here's some urgent delivery. It's an ultra-deep submersible. Now you can continue your dive all the way down. 2,717 feet. Here, you'd see the tip of the tallest building on Earth, the Burj Khalifa. All right, who's sinking all the tall buildings around here? 5,387 feet. This is the depth of one of the oldest and deepest lakes in the world, Lake Baikal. Its area is slightly larger than the entire country of Belgium. 8,040 feet. That's the record depth the Perdido oil platform reaches in the Gulf of Mexico. And its above-water part with three decks is almost as high as the Eiffel Tower. 11,962 feet. This is the average depth of the Atlantic Ocean. You can see a huge tube as wide as a giraffe's neck. And it just seems to be endless. True, this cable connected Europe and North America and used to serve for telegraph communications. 12,303 feet underwater. Suddenly, in the darkness, you see the outline of a ship. No way! That's the Titanic itself! The intense water pressure would crush a person at this depth. So you can only dive down to the Titanic in a submarine. 13,123 feet. Whoa! Here would be the end of the deepest mine in the world, Impon and Gold Mine in Africa. But you still have deeper places to go. Let's speed up! 20,000 feet. Here you can see the deepest debris of an old ship. The USS Johnson sank more than 70 years ago. You can still clearly see the number 557 on its bow. 26,200 feet. Here, in this total darkness, you'll find the deepest fish in the world, the Mariana snailfish. They're as long as a domestic kitten and have almost transparent skin. Their eyes are poorly developed for vision because the sunlight never reaches this deep. 
29,030 feet. If you take Mount Everest, flip it over, and stick it into the Marianas Trench, this is exactly where you'd see its tip. Even though this is the highest point on our planet, you'd still have a lot deeper to go. 35,755 feet down. Here, in the Challenger Deep, you'd still see life. You'd need a microscope for that, though. Bacteria living here feed on organic molecules, similar to oil. A little deeper? Congrats! You've touched the bottom. It's 36,070 feet deep. The pressure here is 1,071 times higher than on the surface. But you're not the first person to have been here. One of the last expeditions to the bottom of the Mariana Trench was in 2012. An American filmmaker descended here in a submarine he designed himself. But the pressure broke some of the engines, so it was hard for him to maneuver here. The sonar was also damaged, and some of the batteries drained. He was in the Challenger Deep for about three hours and took many pictures and videos. If you look closely at the bottom itself, you can see bubbles. It's carbon dioxide and liquid sulfur. It's freezing here because of the extreme pressure and temperature close to freezing. But there's still life here in these harsh conditions. The three microorganisms are most common here. Xenophyophores, amphipods, and small sea cucumbers. There's so few of them because they don't have enough food down here. Usually, there's a lot of palm leaves on the ocean floor, which get there from the land. But the Mariana Trench is 124 miles from the nearest islands. So the only food here is old plankton and fish scales from the ocean's upper layers. But it needs to travel tens of thousands of feet to become food for the bottom dwellers. But can you go even lower into the crust of the Earth? Well then, you'll need to unleash your giant drill and fire up the jet engines. You're pushing another 36 miles through the Earth's crust. And here is its edge. You've entered the upper mantle. It's an ocean of hot lava, 1,800 miles deep. You have to literally swim through this, reaching the outer core, another 1,400 miles deep. Then you reach the inner core, another 755 miles, and congrats! You're at the very center of the Earth. Um, I hate to ask, but how do we get out of here? Hello, Brightsiders! Do you know where the deepest place in the world is? I think it's in the Pacific Ocean, uh, near the Philippines and Papua New Guinea. It's the famous Mariana Trench. So let's take a tape measure, a very long one, and attach its end to the boat on the surface. Now we hold our breath and jump in the water. Fish and marine animals swim by. We descend lower to the depths and into total darkness. And after several hours, we reach Challenger Deep. The tape measure shows a depth of 36,200 feet. The famous Mariana Trench is not the deepest place on Earth, as everybody thought. The Kola Super Deep Borehole, located in Murmansk region in Russia, beats it by a wide margin. And scientists have discovered something unusual and sinister there. When geologists were drilling the hole, they could reach the depth of 9 miles. And then they encountered voids. Scientists on the surface were surprised and scratched their heads and then decided to lower a microphone and dozens of other sensors in these voids. The temperature down below turned out to be 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the microphone recorded something that sounded like human groans and screams. Many people thought the scientists had been able to drill into the underworld. The shocked people up above had already begun to panic. But suddenly, an unknown creature jumped out of the drill pipe. It looked like a black goat that walked on its hind legs. Its body was shrouded in black flames. The creature got out of those deep hollows and ran off into an unknown direction. Okay, wait. These are just myths that one newspaper published on the 1st of April. It's International Joke Day, by the way, but uh, many people believed it. It made many believe the scientists working at the borehole had opened a portal to the nether. And that now, horrible, outworldly creatures were free from their imprisonment. 
But like with any myth, there's some truth to it. The deeper the scientists drilled, the higher the temperature got. At 3 miles deep, it was 160 degrees. At 4.5 miles, it was 250. And at the maximum depth of 7.5 miles, the sensors recorded a temperature of 413 degrees. One day, scientists heard a loud explosion underground. They stopped working and everyone tried to find out what caused such a loud pop. But there was seemingly nothing there. After a while, they continued drilling deeper and at the same depth, no accidents happened. The drilling began in May 1970. They passed the first 4.5 miles quite easily and it was primarily hard granite rock. It was like drilling through a hard wall. But then their drill went into softer layers and the shaft of the hole began to crumble. It was like drilling in wet sand. Every time the workers took the drill out, there was a risk that the hole would collapse under its own weight. As that eventually happened, the scientists picked a new direction to drill and you know what's interesting? In the end, the map of the entire well looked not like a straight beam from top to bottom, but like a tree trunk which had diverged into many different routes. Nine years later, scientists reached the depth of 31,400 feet and broke the world record for the deepest borehole. By 1983, they made it another 8,000 feet deeper. After a brief pause in the work, there was an accident. A part of the drill broke away from the main body and remained in the borehole. For several months, scientists tried to extract the drill, but nothing worked, and they had to return to the depth of 4.5 miles and start all over again. The drill was divided into sections and one such unit could only last about 4 hours before it had to be replaced. In terms of depth, that was only about 32 feet of drilling. Then the drill was lifted to the surface, replaced and lowered back down. On average, the drilling speed was about 200 feet per month. That's like a 20 story building. In 1990, 20 years after the work had begun, scientists reached the final depth of 40,230 feet. That's like 100 soccer fields down. And after another accident, the work stopped. Guinness World Records registered the Kola Super Deep Borehole as the deepest borehole in the world. It's like Mount Everest, plus nine Empire State Buildings on top of it. One of the most unusual discoveries at the Kola Super Deep Borehole was that the soil at the depth of about two miles almost perfectly matches the composition of the surface of the moon. It has given us more insight into how our ancient satellite appeared and formed. It seems that in the early stages of Earth's formation, a giant asteroid crashed into our planet. With that kind of force, it caused an explosion so powerful that part of our planet broke off and flew upward. This chunk of Earth remained in our planet's orbit, cooled and later formed into the moon we know today. Another surprise for the workers was the presence of gold. There was about 2.5 ounces of gold for every ton of soil lifted. The deeper the scientists went, the older the rocks were. In layers of rock about 2.8 billion years old, they found fossilized remains of living organisms. It made the world of science bubble with excitement as it meant that life on our planet appeared 1.5 billion years earlier than first thought. In the early 1990s, they shut down the drilling project. Gradually, the buildings around the borehole and the drilling equipment were lost. Today, a lot of tourists visit the place. It's because of those same myths about creatures from the underworld. Yes, there's a hole 7.5 miles deep under that rusty lid. But the scientists working there never reached their goal. 
They wanted to drill into the Earth's mantle, but to do that, they would have had to dig down to a depth of about 44 miles. At 200 feet per month, it would have taken as long as 80 years. That's assuming no accidents happened. But the deeper it goes, the more interesting it gets. A few years ago, they found a massive amount of water deep underground. Somewhere up to 370 miles down, there's a substantial ocean billions of years old. And the amount of water there is several times greater than in all the oceans, seas and rivers combined on the surface of Earth. The water there is at a scorching 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. But because it's under a tremendous pressure, it doesn't evaporate. It's encased in a crystalline structure of minerals. This ocean was formed in the early stages of our planet's development, when there was only hot lava and debris of space bodies around. But the most exciting thing you can find by drilling is living organisms. They've been there in isolation for billions of years, and they can give us clues as to how life came into being in the first place. Scientists in Antarctica have created a similar borehole. An entire lake half the size of Lake Ontario was discovered under the thick ice. The amount of water in this lake is only 3.5 times less than in the Lake Baikal, the largest lake on Earth by volume. The ice that hides this lake is at least 20,000 years old, and the water beneath it has been isolated from the outside world for about 15 million years. While drilling, scientists lifted a chunk of ice from deep down below and found an unknown bacterium on it. Its genetic code was only 86% similar to known living organisms. That means that we've never seen bacteria like this before or it had come from outer space. But that's just a theory. We know that these bacteria can live in unusual conditions and at water temperatures below freezing. The composition of underground lake water is also different from what we're used to. There's a lot more oxygen and carbon dioxide in it. Add to these conditions complete isolation and we get living organisms that have developed and evolved in a completely different way. Do you understand what it means? The study of deep organisms may give us a clue as to whether life could exist beneath the ice on other planets or their moons. For example, Saturn's moon Enceladus has ice 24 miles thick. There may be an ocean underneath, which is heated by thermal springs. That's all for today. And guys, remember, let's become smarter every day together with Brightside. So you're swimming two miles down at the bottom of the ocean. Don't ask me how, just play along. It's cold and the pressure is intense. No fish in sight. Then you notice a green shiny thing. It's a cookie-cutter shark. Its neck glows in the dark to attract fish and other delicious treats. The shark doesn't look like much. It's small, about the size of a cat. It has brown skin and large green eyes. But looks can be deceiving. Every night, this creature rises to the surface and goes after great white sharks, whales, even swordfish. If you look closely, you'll see a round mouth with a bunch of sharp teeth in it. They don't just bite, they work kind of like a saw. This one's called a cookie-cutter shark because when it sees something delicious, it takes a cookie-shaped bite out of it. These sharks have even been known to disable submarines. Wonder what flavor they are. Our next shark is about the length of a car. Only about a hundred of these sharks have ever been seen, but if you met one, you'd never forget it. It has a big mouth, a huge mouth, a mega mouth, like me! It's the Mega Mouth Shark. You could easily fit in it if you curled yourself up. They're not dangerous, though. Well, not to humans. They feed by swimming around with their mouths open, filtering out plankton and other underwater goodies. The shark has special organs in its mouth that glow, attracting little crustaceans. It swims deep in the ocean in total darkness. 
Probably has a great smile, though. Thresher sharks also have a huge body part, the tail. It's almost half the length of the shark itself, and it looks like a helicopter blade. It's one of the few animals that hunts using its tail. The shark sneaks up on a school of fish and starts to shake its moneymaker. This freaks out some of the fish, which is exactly the plan. In a pinch, it can also use its tail to defend itself. The best thing about this shark? It doesn't attack people. The angel shark. There are quite a few types of angel shark out there, but they're more shark than angel. They're flat like stingrays, and their skin is covered with patterns that help them blend in with the seafloor. Because of this disguise, divers sometimes accidentally touch them, which isn't the best idea. They're fast and have powerful jaws. Still, they prefer the taste of small fish to you. The horn shark has two ridges that look like horns right above its eyes. It's definitely the grandpa of the shark world. Not aggressive, swims pretty slowly, and is up late almost every night. Its two favorite meals, sea urchins and crustaceans. It moves its fin on the seafloor, almost as if it had paws. But don't underestimate this guy. It has one of the strongest bites of any shark. It needs those strong teeth to crush the shells of its late-night meals. And if something tries to attack it, watch out! Horn sharks have sharp spikes on their fins. The award for the ugliest shark goes to the goblin shark, and it's not even close. From the outside, it already looks kind of weird and is about the size of a pink underwater motorbike. It has a long tail and a seriously long nose. It lives way down in the depths of the ocean and loves to eat squid. It's not as fast as its relatives, but it's way more sneaky. It has a secret squid-catching technique, which is totally wild. The shark swims behind the squid. It's catching up, getting closer and closer. But the squid isn't slowing down, no way. It looks like the poor goblin shark won't have any lunch today. Then it opens its mouth. Its jaw is attached to folds of skin that mean it can literally throw its jaw out of its mouth. And it's a shark, so those teeth are sharp. That extra reach helps it grab its lunch, and when the meal's over, it pops its jaw back in its mouth. These sharks have been seen many times off the coast of Japan. They're actually named after the goblins in Japanese myths and fairy tales. There's only one thing out there cooler than a ninja shark. It's the ninja lantern shark. Imagine there's a tube you can slide down that takes you to the bottom of the ocean. It's too dark, you can't see anything. Suddenly, a glowing dot, moving around in the distance. It's coming closer, shooting towards you. It's a blue glowing head. Worse, it looks like this head doesn't have a body attached to it. The ninja lantern shark has black skin, so it's almost invisible in the dark. It's only the size of a human arm, but its small, sharp teeth are no joke. No one really knows why this shark glows. Maybe to attract tasty fish? Another theory out there is that it uses this light to communicate with its friends. It has friends? The hammerhead shark. These ferocious sharks can weigh up to half a ton. They live in tropical waters all over the world, and they're one of the most recognizable sharks out there. Their eyes really are located on the sides of their hammerhead. This means they can see in almost all directions. They even have special neck muscles to lift their head up and down just to see that little bit better. Their favorite food? Stingrays. You know, those flat things that swim along the seafloor, camouflage to look like sand and bits of rock. Stingrays get by by blending in with their surroundings. Danger mostly just swims by. But the hammerhead's eyes see everything. Uh-oh. Great white sharks, hammerheads, and other large sharks live for about 25 years. But one shark can live much, much longer. The Greenland shark can live anywhere from 300 to 500 years. It lives mostly in the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans. It loves to swim deep down where it's dark, so it uses its nose to sniff out food. Since it spends so much time down there, it's figured out how to withstand the strong pressure. It's one of the oldest living, largest, and slowest fish on Earth. Just imagine, you're on an Arctic cruise, and you see one of these sharks moving slowly through the freezing cold water. 
it might be 400 years older than you. Most sharks are omnivorous. They can go after dolphins, other sharks, crabs, sea urchins, smaller or even larger fish, hot dogs. Eh, kidding about the hot dogs. But the bonnethead shark is a bit different. It eats algae for about half its meals. It's actually related to the hammerhead shark, but its head looks more like a shovel. Can you dig it? If you see this guy swimming around, you might think it's a sea snake or a huge water worm. Frilled sharks like to swim way down at the bottom of the ocean, like a lot of sharks. When they're chasing something delicious, they move kind of like a snake. And just like a snake, they like to gulp down their lunch all in one piece. But that doesn't mean they don't have teeth. They have about 200 nice and sharp ones. The saw shark has a long, flat, and seriously spiky nose. Those teeth on its nose never stop growing. Each tooth is equipped with electric receptors to help the saw shark feel around for nearby fish, like a ship's radar. When dinner's nearby, the shark swims up and strikes with its nose, waving it around like a knight showing off his skills. Meanwhile, you won't have time to blink if this guy floats past. Did you see it? How about now? Meet the fastest shark in the world, the short fin mako shark. It can swim up to 35 miles per hour. That doesn't seem that quick on land, but underwater, that's fast. Slower than a cheetah, but faster than most dogs. It's warm-blooded, which is super rare for a shark. That helps it swim to cold and distant places where an ordinary shark simply wouldn't survive. The swordfish goes much faster. It can swim up to 60 miles per hour. It's not a shark, but it's still an amazing creature. In a race, the swordfish will usually come out on top. But it's not just fast, it's ingeniously fast. It has a gland next to its nose that pumps out a special oil. This oil spreads through its nose and comes out through tiny holes. This special oil is waterproof, which lets the swordfish glide through the water at high speed. Want to high-five a sea creature? Well, put your flipper, I mean hand up, for the Tasmanian red handfish. This fish doesn't swim like a fish. It walks. It uses its flipper-like hands to stroll around on the ocean floor. These bottom walkers are disturbed by swimmers and boats a lot. Some people even want to take them home as pets. I think it's better to just give them a wave and swim on by. The Vampire Squid Its species name is Vampirotuthis infernalis, which translates to Vampire Squid from Hell. Oh yes, this vampire squid means to terrify everyone with its name. Its dark red color, its spikes at the bottom, and the scary fact that it can basically turn itself inside out. The vampire squid loves putting on a good show, but it's as harmless as a kitten is to humans. It's as if Dracula scared the pants off you, but he didn't have blood-sucking fangs. The vampire squid feeds on food particles from plants and animal matter floating near the ocean's surface. Since they're not predators, they need good defensive strategies, and their vampiric look is designed to ward off large creatures who want to eat them. Turning themselves inside out is a defensive mechanism since the spiky areas in the inner skin are more intimidating. They also shoot out a substance that does not have color, but is packed with bioluminescent particles to distract predators. The Vaquita Going out on a boat off the coast of Mexico sounds like the perfect vacation. The sun, the blue water, the most endangered sea creature. Wait, what? The vaquita isn't dangerous, but don't expect it to stick around to say hello or sign any autographs. It's incredibly shy. This little cow, that's what it means in Spanish, is one tiny sea mammal. With those black markings around its eyes, it looks more like a sea panda to me. Seeing one should make you feel very special. They're on the brink of extinction, mostly because they get caught by accident in fishing nets. It's estimated that there's only 10 left in the wild. The Blue Dragon This little creature looks like something out of a kid's fantasy movie. It's called the Blue Glaucus, casually referred to as the Blue Dragon or Blue Angel. It can be found in many places, the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. It's kind of a mollusk and it only grows to be about an inch long. What you think is the back is actually the mollusk's bright underbelly. 
It regularly floats on its back so that its blue colors help it camouflage with the water's waves. The blue dragon isn't just pretty, it's also smart. It usually feasts on Portuguese man-o'-wars, also known as Fisalia fisalis. The blue dragon stores their stinging cells for later use, in essence, stealing their defensive mechanisms. When the blue dragon is threatened, it releases those stinging cells it stored, directing them at an enemy to sting them with more power than the Portuguese man-o'-war would have been capable of. As they can store a huge amount of stinging cells, they can be a threat to humans. So, if you find one, don't pick it up. It's best to admire it from a distance. The Barrel Eye Fish If you ever wanted to have Superman's X-ray vision, looking at the Barrel Eye Fish will make you feel like you gained that superpower at some point in your life without even realizing it. The Barrel Eye has a transparent head, so you can see how their eyes and brain look inside. This magnificent creature lives in the deep sea. This is the lowest level of the ocean, where strange creatures roam in near-freezing temperatures and constant darkness. They're exposed to water's pressure that's almost 1,000 times that of the surface. If the idea of the deep sea sends a shiver down your spine, stay tuned to learn about another of its creatures later on. The barrel eye fish can be found in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. You might be wondering, why oh why would a fish have a see-through head? And that would be a fair question. Since the species was discovered in 1939, it was believed that the fish's eyes were set to see straight ahead and couldn't move. So it was assumed that they had tunnel vision. Scientists Bruce Robinson and Kim Reisenbickler from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute recently discovered that the fish can move its eyes vertically to see through the top of its translucent head, thus noticing if there are predators or prey nearby. The transparent head also allows more light to enter so they can detect prey better. It's believed that the barrel eye fish eats jellyfish and small fish species. If you dive in the ocean at night, you might be lucky enough to see how orange ball coralomorph blooms in the dark. But make sure to be quick because as soon as you turn on your flashlight to take a good look, it will retract its tubes back into itself. The Megalodon the whale shark isn't the biggest shark known to humans. If the entire shark species were a kingdom, the prehistoric megalodon would be the ruler of the sea. Megalodon roamed the ocean a long time ago, oh, about 15.9 to 2.6 million years back between the early Miocene and late Pliocene eras. While they've long been extinct, people are still amazed to learn about these gigantic sea beasts. Megalodon could reach anywhere between 45 feet to 60 feet in length with jaws more than 6 feet wide. A fossil of a tooth that once belonged to a megalodon measured at 7 inches. Needless to say, I'm pretty stoked that these guys have long been extinct. But there's still some adventurers out there hoping to meet this monster one day. The Dumbo Octopus This adorable creature, or creepy creature, or however you want to see it, is officially called Grimpoteuthis. More casually, it's referred to as the Dumbo octopus named after the Disney character. Though Dumbo, the elephant, not the octopus, was teased for his big ears, it's highly unlikely that this adorable octopus gets teased by its water neighbors. They are the deepest living octopuses living in the deep sea, and you know how scary that place is. They're only about 8 inches tall and spend their days hovering just above the seafloor eating snails, worms, and other food they find in the current or near ocean vents. There are nearly 17 species of Dumbo octopus, and they all have differences in height, color, and body parts. If you can't get enough strange animals, you'll be glad to learn that the deep sea has barely been explored by humans. So, keep an eye out. There are bound to be more fascinating animals discovered in the deep in the future. The Sea Angel These creatures might look and sound pretty cute, but their diet is far from sunshine and lollipops. Their favorite food are sea butterflies. They lay mucus traps for them and wait in ambush. The Squat Anemone Shrimp This shrimp is tiny, only 0.5 inches. It's also known as a dancer shrimp because of its peculiar behavior. When agitated, it raises its bottom above its head and does a little dance. Divers also say it readily jumps on their hands and cleans them. The Coconut Crab This guy may look pretty creepy, especially when the sun goes down. Mature coconut crabs are around 3 feet in length. Their preferred foods are coconuts, 
but they can also hunt down lizards and even large birds. The Slender Snipe Eel Slender Snipe Eel is a slim and long creature that's still a mystery for marine scientists. It's 4 feet long, and it has at least 750 bones in its spine, which is much more than any other animal in the world. The Sea Pen Sea pen is 7 feet long and it has a lot of varieties, but most of them look indeed like a pen or a quill. The similarity is even more striking when the animal has a water-filled bulb that anchors it to the floor. The Persian Carpet Flatworm This creature looks indeed like a carpet, despite being very small by comparison. It's only 4 inches long, able to become both male and female. It doesn't really mate with other flatworms. Rather, it fights them for the right to bear posterity. The Flamingo Tongue Sea Snails Tourists love these extraordinary snails for their pretty colors, thinking it's a shell, but in fact, the shell is quite dull and hidden underneath colorful soft tissues. They eat softer, toxic parts of corals and store their toxins to protect themselves. Most of the ocean is still shrouded in mystery, whether we're talking about dark corners or creatures that are hiding in the depths. But sometimes, it gives us a peek into scary things it hides in its cold, dark depths. Like when you hear on the news that there are some deep sea creatures washed ashore after a powerful storm once again. Some just look weird, while others are real monsters that live at depths of more than 3,300 feet. The coldest and deepest parts of the ocean have created one specific phenomenon called gigantism. So, sea spiders, squids, worms, and many other animals, mostly invertebrates, or creatures without backbones, they are all way bigger and scarier than the versions we see in the more shallow areas. In the Pacific depths, you can see a sea sponge as large as a minivan. Or what about the colossal squid that lives in sub-Antarctic waters and is nearly 14 times longer than the arrow squid, a type that mostly lives in New Zealand? Researchers found many of these underwater monsters in the abyssal zone of the ocean. Back in 2021, the researchers showed images of the giant phantom jelly. It was at a depth of 3,200 feet. Its tentacles were 33 feet long. Wow, I wouldn't like to face that one on the beach. It probably eats only small fish and plankton, but it can swim to depths of more than 21,900 feet. And down there, this giant jelly doesn't have enough food. How does it survive then? Scientists haven't figured it out yet. And there are even more questions related to the giant squid, the biggest one ever found. This monster is 43 feet long, with a weight of nearly a ton. Imagine if those tentacles would grab your car, or something like that. They would smash it like it was a toy. There's no light in the abyssal zone, Sun rays just can't penetrate that deep, so there's no algae or underwater plants there. Local animals mostly eat snow. Marine snow is not like the regular one you build a snowman with. It consists of any small flakes or remains that fall from the surface of the ocean, maybe even some leftovers that animals up there couldn't eat. So it's not much, but apparently it's enough for very large creatures that hide deep down there like giant squids. Squids that generally live at such depths don't bother going after their prey. They just wait until the poor animal swims right up to their long tentacles and falls into a trap. It may not be the best method ever, because not many animals will even swim into these dark cold parts, but it's the method that saves energy. A giant squid eats only one ounce of fish daily, which is approximately 45 calories. That's nearly 50 times fewer calories than an average person should eat per day. So when a squid gets one fish, it saves it for a couple of days. I hope giant squids won't get the idea to go to the surface and look for food when there's not enough of it in the abyssal zone. And I hope even more that giant Greenland sharks won't get that same idea. You can find them at depths of up to 7,200 feet. They're twice as slow as we usually walk. They swim at a speed of 1.12 feet per second. Their slowness is part of the energy-saving mechanism that creatures down there need to survive. But they can speed up in the form of short bursts when they need to catch prey. But they kind of change their diet from predator to scavenger, 
considering their environment. There will be more leftovers falling from the surface than animals to go after. Greenland sharks grow just 0.4 inches per year, and they're mostly 20 feet long, which means they live for a very long time, sometimes up to 400 years. They also have a slow metabolism, and that's one of the main factors for their long life, too. Greenland sharks like to spend their time in cold waters. They're adapted to that since their tissues have specific chemical compounds that prevent the forming of ice crystals all over their body. That means they have some sort of natural antifreeze. So what makes them so big? Scientists are still not sure, but some theories try to explain it. There's this thing called Kleiber's rule that says bigger animals tend to be more efficient. Just take a small fish and compare it to a whale with a mass hundreds of times bigger. The whale has a greater metabolism. It conserves energy more efficiently and loses less of it to the surroundings through heat. Moving on, bigger animals can ingest bigger prey. They're more likely to go through tough issues in their environment or defend themselves from predators going after them. Also, the body gets bigger when temperatures are lower. The Greenland shark is a perfect example. So are giant sea spiders. Sea spiders are generally common, and you find some very small ones at 0.04 inches. But in deeper parts of the Antarctic, they become three-foot-long giants. They grow so big because the cold water has more oxygen. That way, more of it diffuses into the animal's body, and that allows it to grow bigger. Yeah, both as a creature and a nightmare. And how about this giant tube worm? Researchers found it accidentally while they were exploring the mysteries of the Pacific Ocean floor. They stumbled upon unusual hydrothermal vents. Volcanic heat is a thing that gets them going. As water seeps down through faults or cracks in the rock, these vents change their direction. When the water gets out of the vent, it's rich in different minerals and chemicals. Most animals wouldn't survive being around this toxic soup of chemicals, but not these tube worms. They came as a true surprise, because not only are they not bothered by these toxic vents and the almost boiling temperature of the water, but they developed entire ecosystems there. They're unique because they don't need sunlight to survive. Instead, small bacteria are their main source of energy. That bacteria gets their energy directly from these toxic chemicals. So it's not photosynthesis, but a process called chemosynthesis. And these tube worms don't have mouths. These bacteria live inside them. Strange story, huh? Plus, these scary worms reach up to eight feet. Giant isopods are no better either. They lurk at the depths of the ocean of 1,640 feet or more below, far away from the sunlight, looking like some monstrous wood lice. They spend most of their time on the seabed, hoping to find some food falling from higher levels of the ocean. Check out their small hooked claws at the ends of their legs. Isopods use them to remain more stable while moving around the ocean floor. Since there's no light, they have long antennae that help them feel their way around. These sensory antennas are about half the length of their body. Giant isopods have pretty big eyes compared to their body size, too. They can grow over 12 inches from head to tail. And these fellas are really patient. Remember how we said animals down there rarely get food? Sometimes they need to wait for years to get a proper meal. That's why their metabolism is amazingly slow. Five years later. They can go for five years without eating anything. Imagine that. I get hungry just talking about this. In 2006, a biologist did research to compare the differences between the shallows and the deep sea regions. He realized the deep sea mirrors the island rule. First, isolated parts of land develop biodiversity you won't find anywhere else. Second, small-bodied life there grows much bigger when it's isolated, compared to life on large land masses. Resources are limited, but also competition and predators. And we don't know much about these deep sea creatures. It's too expensive and too complicated to carry out such research. So we'll just wait for more raging storms to show us at least part of the monstrous world cold ocean depths hide. 
It's 2010. You're in the Japanese waters of the Pacific Ocean, about 745 miles south of Tokyo and very close to the island of Iwo Jima. The sky is clear. There are almost no waves. A heavy, low rumble comes from somewhere deep under the sea. It scares away all the flying gulls. And then it gets quiet. Too quiet. It seems that even light waves don't dare to make a sound. Suddenly, a small bubble rises to the surface of the water. Then, thousands of air bubbles start moving up one after another. The water begins to boil and heat up. Its temperature is so high that you can cook eggs or pasta in here. The boiling area grows to the size of a stadium. A huge amount of steam is released into the air. You can see an outline of some huge object through the boiling water. Then, everything stops. The water cools. The amount of bubbles goes down, and the surface of the ocean becomes calm again. That year, an underwater volcano erupted at that specific location. Fortunately, it didn't bring any serious consequences. In August 2021, the eruption repeated. But this time, everything wasn't limited to the bubbling water. The Japanese Coast Guard reported strong volcanic activity in the region. Hot steam and gases came out of the water and rose into the air to a height of 10 miles, which is about twice the height of Mount Everest. The huge awakened volcano began to slowly lift to the surface. If you took a helicopter ride above this place, you'd see more and more land coming out of the water. This is not just a volcano, it's a whole island in the shape of a horseshoe. And this is just the beginning. Seismologists say this island is the tip of a huge volcano. It fills the sky with smoke and ash. The air temperature is rising. Scientists continue to monitor the situation. They believe the volcano can completely get out of the water. Nobody knows what consequences this may have. This isn't the first island that has appeared in the waters of Japan. Underwater volcanoes have erupted several times over the past century. One of the most surprising cases occurred in 2013. That year, a small piece of land was formed next to the already existing island. The underwater volcano that emerged from the water began to grow slowly. At some moment, it connected to the island. After two years, the area of this island increased by 12 times compared to the original size. Smoke is always pouring out of this place, and its surface is filled with red-hot lava flows. The volcano is unstable and isn't going to calm down. Such phenomena occur not only off the coast of Japan. In the 1960s, a volcano awoke on the southern coast of Iceland. For three whole years, it was coming to the surface and had formed an island by 1967. They called it Tsertsi. Unlike the Japanese islands, this is where the volcanic eruptions ended. Now the island is one of the most inaccessible places on the planet. Only a few scientists in the world have permission to walk around this place. They want to learn how the plant and animal life of the island are formed without human intervention. This is a unique event, and here's why. Underwater volcanoes differ in their behavior from land volcanoes. They don't explode and don't release lava flows upwards. A huge amount of water above them creates high pressure. As soon as the magma gets out, the water immediately lowers it to the seafloor. Underwater eruptions don't normally cause any changes on the ocean surface. So, millions of gallons of lava sink to the bottom, cool down, and solidify around the volcano. This lava forms a thick layer of Earth's rock. To make an island appear on the surface, an underwater volcano needs a lot of magma. The next eruption creates another thick layer. Millions of years pass, and passive lava flows form mountains. Constant eruptions increase the height of the seabed. Layer by layer, the cooled lava rises higher and higher. And then, one day, it appears on the surface in the form of an island. Often, underwater volcanoes don't reach the surface and fall asleep forever. Such volcanoes are called seamounts. The tectonic activity also affects the formation of islands. The volcano has a source of magma that comes from the mantle of the planet. The tectonic plate is moving, and a volcano is placed on it. So the plate can lead the volcano away from the source of magma. When a volcano rises, it can simply move aside and no longer erupt. From the outside, the volcanic islands look like an apocalypse. Lava spraying in different directions, smog and ash filling the sky. But in fact, volcanoes are not about destruction. 
but the creation of new life. Lava is any hot metal, but the natural lava flowing out of volcanoes is called magma. When it appears on the surface of the ground, various gases and acids instantly evaporate from it, and magma becomes lava. But underground, it's magma. These molten metals contain trace elements of almost all chemical substances that exist in nature. They enrich the land they're flowing in. Ash is also filled with many different elements. The lava hardens, the ash settles, and this creates favorable conditions for the appearance of a rich ecosystem. It can take millions of years to develop, though. The simplest bacteria appear. They feed on chemical elements coming from the volcano. When you have favorable conditions for bacteria, you get favorable conditions for bigger life forms. Birds flying by also help to develop the new ecosystem. They build nests on the island, bring tree seeds, and plant spores from the continents and other islands. All this enriches life on the volcano. Volcanoes are isolated places, so unique species of animals, insects, and bacteria can appear only there and can't be found anywhere else on the planet. However, if the volcano wakes up, it can also destroy the ecosystem. The entire island can be covered with ash and simply lose all vegetation. But then, on the scorched ground, life can appear again. Hundreds of islands around the world appeared because of the eruptions of underwater volcanoes. Hawaii, Indonesia, and Iceland have them on their territory. Imagine that people settled on a similar volcanic island and built a city there. And one day, the volcano woke up. It once happened, 200 miles south of Tokyo. People built a beautiful town right in the center of an active volcano on the island of Aogashima. In May 1785, the catastrophe began. That day was sunny, and no one could imagine what tragedy was approaching them. At some point, thousands of birds took to the air and flew away from the island. Then, the ground began to shake. A heavy, low sound came out of the town depths. Streams of smoke were coming out of the crater of a green volcano. The volcano was throwing dirt, large stones, and various debris into the sky. The disaster lasted for several weeks. Since then, more than 200 years have passed, and the volcano has never woken up again. The town was rebuilt after the disaster. Now, this place is so great, people don't want to leave, despite the risk of a new eruption. More and more residents are coming to the island. There are many thermal springs, and the waters around the island are rich in fish. But the volcano may wake up at any moment. Fortunately, meteorological and seismological services monitor the situation. A lake can also form inside the volcano, but you shouldn't swim in it. In Indonesia, on the island of Java, there's a volcano with a crater inside. It's filled with turquoise water. The magma inside the volcano consists of many molten metals and chemical compounds, and the lake gets these substances. The volcano emits sulfur dioxide gases that combine with the metallic lake. This gives the water its strong acidity and turquoise color. The steam coming from the lake is acid. When it combines with air, it ignites. This is visible at night. Sulfur accumulations flare up and illuminate everything around. The Easter Island giant heads are so popular that they even have their own emoji. Their true meaning has been a mystery for hundreds of years. But it looks like we at least know how they were built and transported to their permanent location. The Moai statues consist of three parts. A large yellow body, a red hat or topknot, and white inset eyes with a coral iris. Around 1,000 of them were created. The main bodies of most of the statues were made out of volcanic tuff from a local quarry in what used to be a volcano. The material is easy to carve, but not so easy to transport. That's probably why researchers found over 300 unfinished moai back in the quarry. The rest of them stand in various locations, facing the villages as if watching over the locals. So, it looks like the statues were carved lying on their backs. Then, their creators detached them from the rock, moved them down slope, and set them in a vertical position to finish the work. Once it was done, it was time to get the statue to its platform. 
Now, if you've ever moved houses, you know how physically hard it is. So, imagine having to move a statue that is about half as heavy as a house without a car or any modern equipment for a distance of three miles. The locals must have invented some original way of doing it, and scientists tried to recreate it to guess what it was. They tried pulling Moai replicas on wooden sleds. They thought someone could have used palm trees for that purpose, but this theory has been debunked. The most successful experiment so far was wielding ropes to rock the statue down the road in a standing position. This method sounds real because the local Rapa Noai legends mention that the Moai walked from the quarry. And, of course, they needed a good road to get there. In the early 20th century, researcher Catherine Rutledge identified an 800-year-old road network on the island. It was a bunch of pathways around 15 feet wide going from the quarry. She thought that those roads were ceremonial and not built just for the statues. She wasn't a famous scientist back then, so others mostly ignored the theory. Several decades later, famous Norwegian adventurer and archaeologist Thor Heyerdahl published his theory. He mentioned that the roads were built exclusively to transport the Moai, and some of the statues were dropped along the roads for some reason. But in 2010, Researchers found that the statues weren't randomly dropped. They actually reached their final destinations as they were all set on hidden platforms. Plus, the road floor was U-shaped, so pulling massive statues along them wouldn't be easy. You can still find roughly 15.5 miles of these roads on the island and see them from satellite images. And it looks like Catherine Rutledge was right about them. The roads were probably built for pilgrims to a sacred volcano, and the Moai standing by them were sort of signposts. Halfway across the world in southern England lies another mystery made of stone. A massive sound illusion, a symbol of unity, a burial ground, or more. Scientists are still debating the purpose of Stonehenge. It took Neolithic builders around 1,500 years to construct this beauty made of roughly 100 stones standing upright in a circle. Millions of tourists come to see it every year, and heritage protectors were worried about the modern road snaking close to the landmark. That modern road is now sunk into the ground below the grass level. And even though archaeologists assumed they could find an older road under it, they didn't have any high hopes. But when they took off a layer of asphalt, they noticed two parallel ditches that were nearly perpendicular to the road. The ditches connected the shortened sections of the avenue. That's what the archaeologists call the ancient pathway leading up to Stonehenge. It proves that the ancient people used to visit the monument for their purposes, and probably some ceremonies. Another interesting find during a dry summer was three dry patch marks within the stone circle. It looks like they were left there by three massive boulders. So Stonehenge could have been a full circle once. In 2021, archaeologists found a Roman road submerged in the Venetian lagoon. The fact that it runs there on the bottom for nearly 4,000 feet is proof that the Romans were here before sea levels rose and flooded the area. It supports the theory that there was an important settlement here centuries before Venice was founded at the spot in the 5th century CE. The ancient Romans were great at many things, and one of them was building roads. And it looks like they weren't afraid to work on the trickiest terrain. Scans have shown that the ancient road was built right on the beach, and it requires some serious skills. Imagine a village from over a thousand years ago frozen in time. There's still half-eaten food on the tables and personal things left in a rush. It's all preserved so well because it's covered by volcanic ash. Researchers found this village in 2011 in modern-day El Salvador. They believe there was a mass celebration in a Maya village called Seren over 1,400 years ago. 
The whole village was there, preparing the main temple for a ritual when a nearby volcano erupted. The 200 plus residents had no time to rush back to their homes. To save their lives, they had to flee the plaza and run south on a raised road called Sakbe. They managed to escape from the plumes of volcanic ash. In addition to being a superhero and saving all the people, the road had another cool feature. All Sakbe roads had an outer layer of stones. But this one was made of ash. Ironic, isn't it? It proves that the Maya people didn't only use stones to build their roads. Archaeologists discovered several coins in Jerusalem when they were excavating an old street. When they saw the minting dates, they realized the road was built when Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea. Since he was the local ruler, it's almost clear that he gave the order to build the road. The pilgrims most likely used this road to reach the Temple Mount for worship. The pathway, which was laid with over 10,000 tons of limestone, was almost as broad as a London bus is long. It had been there for 2,000 years. It's not common that you find such a luxurious road, and it's not clear why a Roman governor would spend so much money on the road. It was probably his attempt to make the city's population like him. Plus, it was a great way to show he had both money and influence. The Old North Trail is an ancient highway that the inhabitants of North America used for 10,000 years. First on foot, then with dogs, and finally with horses. The first travelers moved around the continent down its paths for thousands of miles long before the first Europeans arrived, and even during the last ice age. They used it to carry trade goods, visit relatives, find a mate, or just explore. Researchers keep finding evidence that the stories and legends of the Blackfoot Indians about this trail are real. And it could be even the road that served one of the most massive human migrations, the people who crossed from Asia on the Bering Land Bridge about 15,000 years ago and settled in North America might have used the ice-free corridor along the Rockies, which later became a part of the trail. The Nakasendo Highway was built in the 17th century during the Edo period of Japanese history to link Kyoto and Tokyo. The 310-mile-long road runs across mountain ranges and down onto the plain. It was one of the five main roads used by the feudal lords and their families to travel to the capital. There were 69 post stations on the route where travelers could stay overnight. The road was built for horses and pedestrians, as the Japanese didn't use carts you can still walk parts of the route. You're flying over the Pacific Ocean when suddenly a storm hits the plane, causing it to shake. The aircraft begins to descend and you lose control. You quickly put on a parachute, eject yourself from the plane and land on an island. It's a good thing you were the only one on the plane transporting some goods overseas. Luckily enough, the storm hasn't damaged your parachute. You unstrap yourself and head to the closest shelter under some palm trees. You're waiting for the storm to be over. The next day. The sun is shining and the waves seem nice and friendly. You wake up and look around. Nothing but a large stretch of water encircling you from all directions. Not a boat, human, or another living being is around. You scout the island, trying to find anything. You don't even know what you're looking for. On one side of the small island, you see some scrap metal and remnants of the plane washed ashore. You rush over there and try to see if there's anything useful. Too bad everything is destroyed. However, one sealed box has made it. You open it and see dozens of duct tape rolls piled on top of each other. After going through the island, you head back to your camp dragging the box of duct tape. You try to figure out what to do. Soon, you get a light bulb moment. There are some places on the island that are hard to access, and since your shoes have been damaged, you fashion out some sandals. To do it, 
you grab some branches and try to use duct tape to make a new pair of shoes. After many failed attempts, you almost give up. But then, you attach some duct tape to pieces of tree bark that are roughly the size of your foot. Those are going to be the soles of your new shoes. The duct tape is smooth and won't hurt your feet. After adding several branches, you wrap the duct tape around your feet and voila! You have duct tape sandals. Now you can venture into the rocky parts of the island without damaging your feet. As you walk along the island, you start feeling the heat. You wrap your shirt around your head, but it's not enough to protect you. You use some duct tape to create a hat with the help of leaves. Then you place it on your head. You're now safe to go. After a while, you bring back some stuff you found around the island. By this time, you've started to feel that your tummy is rumbling. Next, at a rocky reef, you spot some large yummy crabs and fish, but you can't catch them with your bare hands. You grab a long branch, take some palm tree leaves, and tie everything together to make a net. You then use the duct tape to reinforce it and head to the reef. You're wearing your makeshift sandals and the hat to protect your head and carrying the net to catch some fish. So far, you've only used two rolls of duct tape. After a while, you manage to catch some fish and crabs and take them back to the camp. You make a fire and start grilling your catch. You're sitting on a log, but such a seat isn't too comfortable. You take some duct tape and make a mat for yourself. Once the food is ready, you feast on it. Now another problem, water. There's no fresh water around, but a storm is coming. Meanwhile, you take some coconuts and eat dessert while drinking coconut milk to freshen up. You prepare a small hut by gathering branches and leaves and duct taping them together so that water can't seep into your new home. At the same time, you create a funnel out of duct tape to collect rainwater. After getting into the funnel, the water is collected in a makeshift pond, also made out of duct tape. At this point, you've used almost half of the duct tape rolls. The storm starts brewing and you stay inside your hut where you have your new floor mat. You're bored, so you create a chair and table out of duct tape to make the hut a little comfier. It starts raining and you notice that some water has gathered in the reservoir you built. You immediately drink it using a coconut shell as a glass. Your hut manages to withstand the storm and you catch some Z's on your comfy mat. The next day, you check the duct tape supply and see that you are now halfway to finishing your last roll of tape. You've made a secured and solid hut and have a steady food supply from the reef. You've already spent five days on the island, so now it's time to find a way out. You've tried your best to seek help, but nothing. Not a plane or ship in sight. You're desperate to get out, and you're lucky. You spot a cargo ship very far off in the distance. You need to act quickly. After reviewing your box of duct tape, you decide to create a raft to sail away. You gather enough food and water for the journey and get to work. You start by collecting large logs for a base and setting them side by side. You have some rope made from tree bark and leaves to tie the logs together. It's big enough to fit you. You then get another set of logs and place them on top of the base and repeat the same process to create a second layer. This way, you minimize the risk of sinking. In the end, you duct tape all weak spots to reinforce your raft. You use some branches to create oars for rowing with paddles made out of duct tape. You see that you've used around 75% of your supply, including the tape you use to construct the hut and furniture. It's not as strong as fresh duct tape, but it still does the job. After the base and oars are finished, you create a small hut to shelter your food and supplies and protect them from waves. Also, you make a mast out of wood and use a piece of cloth as a sail. 
you put the raft on the water and begin rowing. So far so good. You open the sail and take a break from rowing. You turn around and take a look at the island that has been your home for the past five days. You're going on a dangerous journey, risking it all. But if you remain on the island for too long, then you definitely won't make it. It's been an hour already, and the island is barely visible. But the ship is getting closer. You still have one more roll of duct tape to use in emergency situations. The waters are calm, and you see dolphins swimming around. You snack on some fish and drink some water before noticing that the waves have gotten larger. You prepare your sail and duck for cover. It's a good thing your raft is sturdy. Large waves crash against it, knocking off some of your food and water. But the raft is still in one piece. As time passes, the sun begins to set, and there's still no sign of life. You use the rest of the duct tape to repair the raft. Even though you lost some food during the storm, you have your net to catch more fish. You start a small and safe bonfire in a coconut shell, cook the fish, and start eating. You turn around and spot a ship coming your way. You immediately grab a branch, light it, and start waving it for the ship to see you. It looks like it will miss you, but then someone on the ship notices you. They drop down an emergency boat to pick you up and rescue you. It's safe to say that duct tape has truly saved your. Ever wonder why, despite all our advancements in technology and science, there's a vast expanse of our own planet that we barely know about. Believe it or not, over 80% of our oceans remain uncharted territory. It's as if we've got this massive aquatic playground in our backyard, and we've barely scratched the surface. Also, did you know that only about 7% of our oceans have a special tag called Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs? How come this colossal body of water that envelops most of our planet is also among the most vulnerable and misunderstood spaces in the universe? Pressure has a lot to do with it. Our deep ocean is a beast of a place with no visibility, freezing temperatures, and pressure that's so intense that in certain areas it would make you feel like you're having the weight of 50 jumbo jets on your body. No wonder we're having an easier time sending people into space than to the bottom of the ocean. The deeper you go into the waters, the more pressure piles up. But let's not forget we have tech on our side, right? Scientists now use these cool satellite technologies that track the color of the ocean to check how much phytoplankton is there. For example, why is this important? You might ask. Because these little plant-like critters are actually pretty major players in our big blue oceans. In the grand scheme of things, in the aquatic world, phytoplankton is like the bedrock of the ocean food chain. It gives life to almost everything. From the tiny zooplankton, which are animal-like microorganisms, to those colossal, magnificent whales. When these technologies first came around, satellites could get clear images of the ocean faster than a ship could take the same number of measurements in 10 years. But it's not all about looking at the ocean from space. Sometimes you gotta dive in there and see it for yourself. Thankfully, we've come a long way in ocean exploration tech too. We've got things like floats and drifters that ride the ocean currents while collecting data, and a whole fleet of underwater vehicles, some of which are manned, some remote controlled, and some even autonomous. Remember James Cameron, the guy who made the movie Titanic? He's super into exploring the ocean, and in 2012, he set a record by going down to the Mariana Trench in a vertical torpedo sub. He thinks there's nothing like being in the ocean and experiencing it firsthand. Other companies use a mix of technologies for their ocean explorations. It led them to discover amazing stuff like a deep sea coral reef near Morocco, the only one still growing in the Mediterranean Sea. They've also discovered new species and documented ones previously thought to live only in the Atlantic. These efforts have convinced the local authorities to declare some places as marine parks. As with most scientific areas, the road isn't without its bumps. These expeditions can cost quite a lot, and the lack of detailed maps and data only adds to the challenge. 
we can't always rely on bathymetric information, meaning the study of the ocean floor, because it's often not available. And that's the tricky part. We need to explore more to know more, but getting the funds for these kinds of projects can be tough when there are so many unknown variables. One particular company's explorations have helped protect nearly 4 million square miles of oceans so far. The data they collect during their expeditions is invaluable. It's used to identify new species, locate vulnerable habitats, and even show where threatened species are being overlooked. Their work helps dismiss excuses from local authorities who claim they lack the necessary information to establish more MPAs. The same company supports a goal known as 30 by 30, aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. It's a big target and there's a long road ahead, but ongoing ocean exploration can provide the proof needed to keep more of our oceans safe. We also need to set aside areas for protection and research, even when we don't have all the facts just yet. On that note, some cool scientists have recently stumbled upon a gigantic and mysterious world beneath the Pacific Northwest Coast's ocean floor. The best part is, this massive realm of life is pretty much cut off from the rest of the world above, making it like a secret underground club that only the best microbiologists have access to. Picture an active city. Except the city is microscopic cracks in the basalt rocks of our oceanic crust, and its residents are microbes. These tiny creatures aren't like you and me. They don't rely on sunlight or the organic products of land and water ecosystems for sustenance. Instead, they thrive on chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Scientists call this type of life chemosynthetic, which sounds complicated, but it basically means life sustained by chemical reactions. While this sort of life has been found deep in mines and around seafloor hydrothermal vents, the scale at which these creatures are found under the oceanic crust is unprecedented. It might even be the most extensive ecosystem on Earth. A geomicrobiologist from Denmark was part of the team that made this discovery. He claimed that over 50% of our planet's surface is oceanic crust, which is an average of 4 miles thick. Imagine the size of this chemosynthetic party happening down there. This discovery didn't happen overnight. Since the 90s, scientists have found weird tiny holes in the basalt rocks that make up much of Earth's outer crust. They seem like they might have been made by bacteria. But hey, there was supposed to be no life there. I mean, imagine trying to survive in a place that's hot, deep, dark, dense, and mostly devoid of the organic compounds we need for life. Yet, here they are. In the following years, more pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Scientists found that the oceanic crusts had different conditions at the centers and edges. At the centers, rocks are jam-packed with energy-rich compounds that support these tiny life forms. But by the time they reach the edges, these chemicals are all gone. Fast forward to now, and it's time to put the puzzle together. A microbial ecologist from the University of North Carolina worked on this research and says we now have solid evidence of microbial life in the cracks and crevices of deep ocean basalt. The next question scientists asked was, how far does this life extend? Researchers collected samples of crust from a plate roughly 120 miles off of Washington's coast, drilling deep beneath the ocean's surface. What they found down there was remarkable. The life down there runs on a unique fuel, hydrogen. Yep, in the absence of sunlight, hydrogen provides the energy for all their biological processes. These microbes use hydrogen to transform carbon dioxide into organic matter. This matter and other byproducts, like methane, then fuel other organisms, creating a network of life. Of course, the life down there isn't as complex as the one we know up here. Scientists doubt there will be any multicellular life under the ocean because it's too hot and energy poor. But hey, who knows? This universe under our oceans still has a lot to reveal. This whole thing is significant for many reasons. First, it confirms that life can exist in places without oxygen, which changes our perspective on where we can find life. 
This makes us wonder if life could exist under similar conditions on other planets where surface conditions might be too harsh. The implications on Earth are also profound. If a large portion of life exists in the oceanic crust, then our understanding of life on our own planet could be completely changed. This exciting discovery stretches our understanding of life and prompts us to keep exploring the mysterious depths of our oceans, pushing the limits of our understanding. NASA is also in on the whole deep sea exploration project. Why? Shouldn't they be preoccupied with outer space? Because they're hoping to find hints about what the oceans on other planets might look like. NASA specialists are really hopeful that by unearthing underwater secrets, we can solve some of the big questions about space. Plus, they're testing some nifty equipment for future journeys across our solar system. A wanderer walking through a desert feels the scorching sun like never before. You can see him from afar thanks to his shining clothes. His long hoodie is covered with foil. It reflects sunlight and protects him from heat. The ground is so hot that shoe soles can melt on it. That's why the wanderer's boots are covered with heat-resistant material. A cloudless sky, barren land, and heat. But the wanderer is not in the desert. He's walking on the ocean's bottom. He doesn't know why this happened, but all the oceans on Earth dried up. It happened almost instantly, and even the greatest minds in the world don't know why. The wanderer knows only one thing. When it happened, his family was on the other side of the ocean. For several months, he's been traveling across this lifeless land, and he won't stop until he finds his family. The landscape around is spectacular. People have finally found out the secrets of the ocean depths. The seabed consists of huge mountain ranges and volcanoes. They fell asleep forever after the water had disappeared. Also, there are huge trenches leading to the unexplored depths of the planet. People had to build bridges to get over these enormous cracks in the ground. But most of the ocean floor is flat plains, boundless, lifeless, merciless. The wanderers walking across a huge canyon. Once, it was swarming with sea life. The man puts on a gas mask, but not because of a sandstorm. Many fish and other marine inhabitants used to live in such canyons. Now, all that's left is a terrible smell. The wanderer passes by huge skeletons of whales. Among them, he notices dirty tents. People are hiding there from heat. The temperature in the area is much higher than in the Sahara Desert. One of the main functions of the ocean was to distribute heat all over the planet. The sun emits heat and radiation. The ocean absorbed this energy. Lots of currents were warm, and they carried this warmth around the world. The water got heated at the equator, then it evaporated and turned into clouds. When warm air rose, it pulled along colder air from below. This allowed the energy to be evenly distributed. In simple words, the ocean cooled hot places and brought warmth to cold ones. Now there's none of this. Every day the sun burns the equator and dries up the rest of the planet. The wanderer doesn't come close to the tents. He is carrying the most valuable treasure in the world and doesn't want people to notice him. The inhabitants of Earth are just trying to survive, and many have forgotten about such a thing as morality. Fortunately, the wanderer still remembers. The thoughts of the family help him remain a good person. Sometimes it complicates his life. Like now, for example. In the distance, he sees a young girl. She doesn't look well. There's no one around, and the wanderer decides to help her. Out of his backpack, he pulls a thing worth more than all the gold on the planet, a bottle of water. The girl takes a few sips, but instead of thanking the wanderer, she starts screaming. It's a trap. Her accomplices appear from different sides. Looters. They're gonna take everything. The wanderer runs away. He hasn't eaten for several days, and his strength is leaving him. He won't be able to keep going much longer. The marauders are closing in on him. The wanderer throws the bottle aside. His pursuers rush to the water like crazy. They forget about the mate and fight one another for the bottle. The chances of the wanderer's survival have greatly decreased. He could make this bottle last at least several days. Plus, he's also lost a lot of fluid because of running. In the beginning, there was no panic because of a lack of water. The ocean dried up, but its waters were salty anyway. People still had seas, 
lakes, and rivers. But the problem was that the ocean was feeding them. When the ocean water evaporated, it formed clouds. These clouds moved all over the world and enriched lakes and rivers with rain. Now, there are almost no clouds. The sun started heating Earth much more. Lakes and seas dried up alarmingly quickly. At that moment, real chaos began. The sun is going down on the horizon. Sunset is near. It's not so hot anymore. The exhausted wanderer continues walking. In the distance, he notices something that makes him stop, take out a small shovel, and start digging quickly. There's no shelter around, just a flat plain. The wanderer speeds up, otherwise it might be too late. The pit is finally ready. The man jumps down and covers his head with a cloak. A few seconds later, a strong ash storm passes through the entire plain. The smallest particles of ash can penetrate through clothes and get into the lungs. The wind is so strong that it can knock anyone down. When the oceans dried up, the sun began to burn the surface of the planet. This led to massive forest fires. The flames destroyed almost all the trees. Huge clouds of carbon dioxide and ash formed. Driven by the wind, they travel the world and poison everything around. The wanderer is sitting in the pit while a terrible hurricane is sweeping over his head. He thinks of his family and slowly falls asleep. Cold wakes him up. Frosty air chills him to the bone. So it's night now. The wanderer climbs out of the pit and finds himself under bright stars. As soon as the water dried up, almost all clouds disappeared. Factories stopped working. Cars no longer emitted carbon dioxide. Thanks to this, comets and the most distant stars can be seen in the sky. The wanderer has seen them a thousand times, but he's still not used to the breathtaking picture. It's like he's looking at the sky through a telescope. An icy gust of wind brings the wanderer back to reality. He won't survive the night if he doesn't find a warmer place. Before, nights were warmer thanks to the energy of the ocean. Now, as soon as the sun goes down, temperatures drop dramatically. The wanderer needs to move to stay warm. He starts walking faster. Soon, he notices some lights in the distance. It's probably other looters. The wanderer goes deeper into the valley. Stars in the moon illuminate his way. Unfortunately, he is running out of energy. He pulls a protein bar out of his pocket, but he needs at least a bit of water to eat it. To digest food, your body needs liquid. If the wanderer eats the bar, he'll only get thirstier. He can't walk and falls to the ground. He checks his pockets and finds a small kerosene tablet. He lights it using a matchstick. A tiny flame protects him from cold. To distract himself from thirst, the wanderer takes out an old MP3 player. He charged it during the day using the solar panels on his backpack. The man puts on headphones. Classical music calms him down. He lies on the ground next to the burning tablet. He needs to gain strength to continue his journey tomorrow. It's morning. In an hour, the sun will start burning the ground again. It's crucial to find water while he still has some time left. The wanderer inspects the territory and notices a spot where the ground is darker. In his previous life, the wanderer worked as a surveyor. He takes a few steps and touches the ground. It feels cool. There's an underground spring here. He begins to dig. The ground is getting wet. Water starts seeping out of the soil. The wanderer fills his empty bottles. Things don't look that bad anymore. It's getting a bit more difficult to breathe with each new day. In the past, phytoplankton and algae produced up to 70% of all the oxygen on the planet, but not anymore. Several days have passed. The wanderer runs out of water and food again. Fortunately, not for long. He's now walking among huge sunken ships. He sees modern aircraft carriers, liners, and even ancient pirate boats. In the distance, he spots huge mountains. The tops of these rocks are what used to be called the shore. The ocean floor is ending. The thoughts about reuniting with his family give him more strength. The man reaches the top and finds himself in the middle of a ruined city. It's empty. Where have all the people gone? Where is my family now? The wanderer asks himself. The man walks through the abandoned streets and meets an old man. He says that almost all the people who used to live here left the city and went to Antarctica. The wanderer has a new goal. 
He's going to get to the icy mainland no matter what. He will find his family. For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds. Some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over seven minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, 
what species it is or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum, and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way, from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. Okay, let's try something together. Open any world map you have available. It can be the one you find in your bookcase or even an online version. Take a look at the vast area covered by water. That's 71% of the Earth's surface. And all that is salt water from the world's oceans. 
There aren't any borders between the four oceans we've all come to know, but oceanographers and the world's countries did traditionally split these waters into four distinct regions – the Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, and Arctic Oceans. And here comes the big surprise. The scientific community has recently recognized the fifth body of water. It's called the Southern Ocean, and three of the four original oceans border it. It circumnavigates Antarctica and the lower portion of the globe and reaches Australia and the southern portions of Africa and South America. What makes this ocean so special? How did the scientific community eventually recognize it? And more importantly, what mysterious creatures does it hide? <laughs> Let's find out! The Antarctic Ocean, or the Southern Ocean, was first mentioned back in 1937 in the second edition of the International Hydrographic Organization's Limits of Oceans and Seas. That's a mouthful. Back then, this organization considered that it was wrong to consider the Antarctic Ocean as its own distinct body of water. Why? Well, because at that time, an ocean was defined as water surrounded by land and not water surrounding land. However, they reconsidered it in 2000 and voted to include this ocean in the official list. They also decided on the name Southern Ocean over the commonly used Antarctic Ocean. Finally, the organization concluded that the ocean should be considered as ending at the 60th parallel south latitude. But how old is this ocean? Well, many specialists believe it to have formed only 30 million years ago, which would make it the youngest of the world's oceans. It was created when Antarctica and South America moved away from each other during the early stages of our planet's development. This unique water current is a distinctive component of the Southern Ocean, as it helps keep the waters flowing around the icy continent. It's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and it moves to the east with incredible speed. It's estimated that it moves an enormous amount of water per second. Some of the disputes regarding the Southern Ocean also have to do with this amazing current. Some specialists believe it separates the water of the Southern Ocean from the waters of the nearing Atlantic or Pacific. Only the rapid circulating water is considered the Southern Ocean. On the other hand, though, a handful of scientists say that the current actually makes the naming issue more complex by not limiting the waters to a specific geographic location. They believe that the waters in the current are different in terms of composition from waters in the northern oceans because they are way colder and have a lot more salt. Sailors don't really like this new body of water, mostly because of the frequent cyclone-like storms that it experiences. They happen because of the big temperature difference between the ice packs and the ocean waves. As a result, these storms are very difficult to surpass for any sailors that happen to encounter them. I mean, really, these are the strongest winds found anywhere on our planet. More so, the vessels going through this area must also be wary of the frequent icebergs that may pop up every now and then, and also of the low surface temperatures. Just to paint you a better picture, some of the icebergs found here can span over several hundred meters and can exist all year round, regardless of the season. The latitudes from 50 to 70 have even earned the nicknames of Furious 50s or the Shrieking 60s because of these intense year-round storms. Even the landscape is unique. They say the Southern Ocean has bluer glaciers, colder air, and more intimidating mountains than anywhere else in the world. Now, let's get to the mysterious creatures that call this place home, as thousands of species of wildlife live only here and nowhere else in the world. Let's start with the quirky sea pig, or one of the sea cucumbers as it's sometimes called. There are a lot of them in the waters off Antarctica. Why is it called that way, though? Because of its pink hue and round, bloated looks. On a closer look, it even appears to have a little tail and set of ears, just like a pig. They do help a lot with the quality of the waters here, filtering sand and sediment. Then there are the hoff crabs that live on the floor of the Antarctic Sea. The Southern Ocean is a cold water environment, but crabs are more adapted to warmer waters. So hoff crabs gather around the warmth made by volcanic vents. They get the needed warmth and food here. You can find them in large piles, one on top of another, literally filling the space at the vent openings. Now, wonder how they got their unofficial name? 
Well, it's because of their apparent similarity to the actor David Hasselhoff, whose impressive chest reminded explorers of the crab. Okay. Ever seen a fish that's completely transparent? You'd have to get to these waters down in the south, but they do exist, and they are simply called the ice fish. You can basically see inside them, being completely clear and all. That's because of their see-through skin and because they don't have any red blood cells. Their special power is that they can use antifreeze to prevent their bodies from going solid in the cold waters of the Southern Ocean. Instead of the standard thicker blood, the red one with hemoglobin, ice fish have thinner blood that moves around more easily throughout their bodies, hence giving them the much-needed nutrients and oxygen. Now, is there a monster hidden in these waters? Some people believe this to be the case. And thanks to recent research, we even have video footage of it. Some Australian researchers stumbled upon a bunch of weird-looking creatures that were swimming near the seafloor of the Southern Ocean. This pink blob-like fish seemed to be propelled by a little pair of fins. To quote them on it, it seemed to resemble a chicken just before you put it in the oven. I'm not sure I even want to know what that looks like. It took them some time and research to identify the monster. It's a shy species of sea cucumber, known more by its uh, creative nickname, the Headless Chicken Monster. We've known this creature has existed since the late 1800s, but we've barely ever seen it. And we've only ever captured it on tape once before when it was spotted in the Gulf of Mexico, which is quite far from the waters off the coast of East Antarctica. There's so much we don't know about this creature, like how many of them exist in our waters and how they live, eat, and reproduce. Ever heard of the emperor penguin? It's not a penguin species that just happens to have a crown on its head, if that's what you're thinking. But they are one of those penguins that inhabit this specific location and are also the largest species of their kind altogether. What makes them special is that they make their colonies on the sea ice, and most of them never step foot on land. More so, penguin dads lose almost half their weight while incubating the eggs. They're also fascinating swimmers, able to dive deeper and longer than any other bird, up to 700 feet. Not to mention they can stay submerged for up to 18 minutes at a time as they gather food. We have yet to uncover all the secrets of the mysterious Southern Ocean. But it's clear that it's home to some unique and fragile marine ecosystems. Recognizing it as a new ocean could be one way to focus the public attention on it and help its conservation. When you look at the seas and oceans on a map, you might think that they just flow into each other. Like there's really only one big ocean and people just arbitrarily gave different names to its different parts. Well, guess what? You'll be amazed at how much more substantial the borders between them actually are. For example, the border between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans is like a literal line between two different worlds. It looks like the two oceans meet at an invisible wall, which does not let them flow into each other and mix their waters. Why on earth does that happen? Obviously, there's no actual invisible wall inside, and water is just water. So what could be interfering with its mixing? Well, the thing is that water isn't just water. There can be different kinds. The Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans have different densities and chemical makeups, the level of salinity and other qualities. One can see by their color that they are far from the same. Borders like this, between two bodies of water with different physical and biological characteristics, are known as haloclines. Jacques-Yves Cousteau discovered one of them while he was deep diving in the Strait of Gibraltar. The layers of water with different solidity looked like they were divided with a transparent film, and each layer had its own distinct flora and fauna. Haloclines appear when water in one ocean or sea is at least five times saltier than in the other. You can create a halocline at home if you pour some seawater or colored salty water in a glass and then add some fresh water on top of it. The only difference is that your halocline will be horizontal and ocean haloclines are vertical. For those of you who are paying attention in chemistry class, you might remember that if you have two liquids with different densities in one space, the denser liquid should eventually end up below the less dense one. 
By that logic, the border between the two oceans should look not like a vertical line, but a horizontal one. And the difference between their solidity would become less obvious the closer they got to each other. So why doesn't it work like that? Firstly, the difference in density of the two oceans is not big enough for one of them to sink down and the other one to rise up, but it is big enough to not let them mix. Another reason is inertia. There is an inertial force known as the Coriolis force, which influences objects when they are moving in a system of axes, which in turn are moving as well. In simpler terms, the Earth is moving, and all the moving objects on it are carried along acted upon by this Coriolis force, deviating slightly from their natural course. As a result, the objects on the Earth's surface don't move straight on, but deviate in a curve, clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern. But because the Earth is moving slowly, after all, it does take the planet a whole day to make a full circle around its axis, the Coriolis effect isn't easy to observe in the short term it becomes easier to notice only in long-term intervals, like with cyclones or ocean flows. And this is why the direction of flows in the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans is different. This difference also doesn't let them mix. Another important difference between these two ocean waters is the strength of molecule connection, or surface tensile strength. Thanks to this strength, molecules of the same kind hold on to each other. The two oceans have totally different surface tensile strengths, which also doesn't let them mix. Maybe if the waters were completely still, they could gradually start mixing over time. But as they flow in opposite directions, they just don't have time to do this. We think that it's just water in both oceans, but its separate molecules meet for just a very short moment and then get carried away with the ocean flow. But if you think that it's only the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans that don't get along with each other, you are sorely mistaken. There's lots of places on the planet where the waters of the two seas or rivers don't mix, and for even more weird reasons. For example, there's a different kind of border called a thermocline. These are borders between waters of different temperatures, like between the warm water of the Gulf Stream and the much colder North Atlantic Ocean. But the most interesting kinds are called chemoclines. These are borders between waters having different microclimate and chemical makeup. The Sargasso Sea is the biggest and most widely known chemocline. It is a sea within the Atlantic Ocean, which has no shores, but is very obviously distinct. You can't not notice it. Let's now take a look at some other spectacular clines we have on planet Earth. And just as a heads up, I might mispronounce some of these names coming up, so please forgive me. First up, we have the North and Baltic Seas. These two seas meet near the Danish city of Skagen, the water in them doesn't mix because of different densities. Sometimes you can see the waves of the two seas clash into each other, making foam. Their waters do mix very, very gradually. That's why the Baltic Sea is slightly saline. If there had been no water coming to it from the North Sea, it would have just been a freshwater lake. Next up, the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. They meet at the Strait of Gibraltar and have both a different density and salinity. So there's two reasons their waters don't mix. Then we have the Caribbean Sea and Atlantic Ocean. The place where they meet is near the Antilles, and it's very easy to spot. It looks like someone has painted water with two different shades of blue. Another place where these two meet is Eleuthera Island of the Bahamas. The Caribbean Sea water is turquoise, and the Atlantic Ocean water is dark blue. There is also the Suriname River and the Atlantic Ocean, which meet near Paramaribo in South America. How about the Uruguay River and its afflux? These two meet in Misiones province in Argentina. One of them is claimed to be used in agriculture, and the other has an almost red tint to it because of loam during rainy seasons. Here's an interesting one. The Rio Negro and the Solimoes Rivers, part of the Amazon River. Six miles from Manaus in Brazil, the Rio Negro and Solimoes Rivers flow into each other, but don't mix for about 2.5 miles. The Rio Negro is dark and the Solimoes is light. They have different temperatures and speeds of flow. Then there's the Moselle and Rhine rivers, which meet in Koblenz, Germany. The water in the Rhine is lighter than that of the Moselle. Okay, how about three different bodies, like the Ilz, Danube, and Inn rivers? The junction of these three rivers is in Passau, Germany. The Ilz is a small mountain river to the left, 
The Danube is in the middle, and the Inn is a light river to the right. The Inn is wider than the Danube here, but is still its afflux. Take a look at the Aleknanda and Bhagirati rivers, which meet in India. Aleknanda is dark, and Bhagirati is light. I really hope I got those right. The Irtish and Ulba rivers flow into each other in Kazakhstan, near the city whose name is Ust Kamenogorsk. The Irtish has clean water, and the Ulba's water is cloudy. Moving further east, the Jianling and Yangtze rivers meet in Chongqing, China. I really hope that's close at least. The Jialing is clean and the Yangtze is brown. The Irtish River actually has another intersection with the Alm River. These two rivers flow into each other in Omsk, Russia. Here, the Irtish is cloudy and the Alm is pure and transparent. Speaking of Russia, the Chuya and Katun rivers meet in the Altai Republic. The water of the Chuya has an unusual cloudy white color here and looks dense and thick. The Katun, by contrast, is clean and turquoise. Flowing into each other, they form a single two-colored stream that does not mix for some time. On the other side of the globe, we have the Green and Colorado Rivers. The place of their junction is National Park Canyonlands in Utah, USA. The Colorado River is brown and the green is, well, green. The corridors of these rivers go through rocks with different chemical makeup. That's why they have such a big contrast of colors. Last but not least, we have the Rhone and Arve rivers. They flow into each other in Geneva, Switzerland. The Rhone is a pure river that flows out from the lakes of Geneva, while the Arve is cloudy and gets its water from the glaciers of the Chamonix Valley. This is by no means an exhaustive list of all the strange climes in our beautiful planet, but as you can see, it happens a lot more often than you think. These are the kinds of environmental oddities that can really teach you about the way the natural world works. If you're curious enough, of course. Thanks for watching. Oh, and let me know how well I did with the pronunciations. Constructive feedback is always helpful. A wanderer walking through a desert feels the scorching sun like never before. You can see him from afar thanks to his shining clothes. His long hoodie is covered with foil. It reflects sunlight and protects him from heat. The ground is so hot that shoe soles can melt on it. That's why the wanderer's boots are covered with heat-resistant material. A cloudless sky, barren land, and heat. But the wanderer is not in the desert. He's walking on the ocean's bottom. He doesn't know why this happened, but all the oceans on Earth dried up. It happened almost instantly, and even the greatest minds in the world don't know why. The Wanderer knows only one thing. When it happened, his family was on the other side of the ocean. For several months, he's been traveling across this lifeless land. And he won't stop until he finds his family. The landscape around is spectacular. People have finally found out the secrets of the ocean depths. The seabed consists of huge mountain ranges and volcanoes. They fell asleep forever after the water had disappeared. Also. There are huge trenches leading to the unexplored depths of the planet. People had to build bridges to get over these enormous cracks in the ground. But most of the ocean floor is flat plains. Boundless, lifeless, merciless. The wanderers walking across a huge canyon. Once, it was swarming with sea life. The man puts on a gas mask, but not because of a sandstorm. Many fish and other marine inhabitants used to live in such canyons. Now. All that's left is a terrible smell. The wanderer passes by huge skeletons of whales. Among them, he notices dirty tents. People are hiding there from heat. The temperature in the area is much higher than in the Sahara Desert. One of the main functions of the ocean was to distribute heat all over the planet. The sun emits heat and radiation. The ocean absorbed this energy. Lots of currents were warm, and they carried this warmth around the world. The water got heated at the equator, then it evaporated and turned into clouds. When warm air rose, it pulled along colder air from below. This allowed the energy to be evenly distributed. In simple words, the ocean cooled hot places and brought warmth to cold ones. Now there's none of this. Every day the sun burns the equator and dries up the rest of the planet. The wanderer doesn't come close to the tents. He is carrying the most valuable treasure in the world and doesn't want people to notice him. 
The inhabitants of Earth are just trying to survive, and many have forgotten about such a thing as morality. Fortunately, the Wanderer still remembers. The thoughts of the family help him remain a good person. Sometimes, it complicates his life. Like now, for example. In the distance, he sees a young girl. She doesn't look well. There's no one around, and the Wanderer decides to help her. Out of his backpack, he pulls a thing worth more than all the gold on the planet. A bottle of water. The girl takes a few sips, but instead of thanking the Wanderer, she starts screaming. It's a trap! Her accomplices appear from different sides. Looters. They're gonna take everything. The Wanderer runs away. He hasn't eaten for several days, and his strength is leaving him. He won't be able to keep going much longer. The Marauders are closing in on him. The Wanderer throws the bottle aside. His pursuers rush to the water like crazy. They forget about the mate and fight one another for the bottle. The chances of the Wanderer's survival have greatly decreased. He could make this bottle last at least several days. Plus, he's also lost a lot of fluid because of running. In the beginning, there was no panic because of a lack of water. The ocean dried up, but its waters were salty anyway. People still had seas, lakes, and rivers. But the problem was that the ocean was feeding them. When the ocean water evaporated, it formed clouds. These clouds moved all over the world and enriched lakes and rivers with rain. Now, there are almost no clouds. The sun started heating Earth much more. Lakes and seas dried up alarmingly quickly. At that moment, real chaos began. The sun is going down on the horizon. Sunset is near. It's not so hot anymore. The exhausted wanderer continues walking. In the distance, he notices something that makes him stop, take out a small shovel, and start digging quickly. There's no shelter around, just a flat plain. The wanderer speeds up, otherwise it might be too late. The pit is finally ready. The man jumps down and covers his head with a cloak. A few seconds later, a strong ash storm passes through the entire plain. The smallest particles of ash can penetrate through clothes and get into the lungs. The wind is so strong that it can knock anyone down. When the oceans dried up, the sun began to burn the surface of the planet. This led to massive forest fires. The flames destroyed almost all the trees. Huge clouds of carbon dioxide and ash formed. Driven by the wind, they travel the world and poison everything around. The Wanderer is sitting in the pit while a terrible hurricane is sweeping over his head. He thinks of his family and slowly falls asleep. Cold wakes him up. Frosty air chills him to the bone. So it's night now. The Wanderer climbs out of the pit and finds himself under bright stars. As soon as the water dried up, almost all clouds disappeared. Factories stopped working. Cars no longer emitted carbon dioxide. Thanks to this, Comets and the most distant stars can be seen in the sky. The Wanderer has seen them a thousand times, but he's still not used to the breathtaking picture. It's like he's looking at the sky through a telescope. An icy gust of wind brings the Wanderer back to reality. He won't survive the night if he doesn't find a warmer place. Before, nights were warmer thanks to the energy of the ocean. Now, as soon as the sun goes down, temperatures drop dramatically. The Wanderer needs to move to stay warm. He starts walking faster. Soon, he notices some lights in the distance. It's probably other looters. The Wanderer goes deeper into the valley. Stars in the moon illuminate his way. Unfortunately, he is running out of energy. He pulls a protein bar out of his pocket, but he needs at least a bit of water to eat it. To digest food, your body needs liquid. If the Wanderer eats the bar, he'll only get thirstier. He can't walk and falls to the ground. He checks his pockets and finds a small kerosene tablet. He lights it using a matchstick. A tiny flame protects him from cold. To distract himself from thirst, the Wanderer takes out an old MP3 player. He charged it during the day using the solar panels on his backpack. The man puts on headphones. Classical music calms him down. He lies on the ground next to the burning tablet. He needs to gain strength to continue his journey tomorrow. It's morning. In an hour, the sun will start burning the ground again. It's crucial to find water while he still has some time left. The wanderer inspects the territory and notices a spot where the ground is darker. In his previous life, the wanderer worked as a surveyor. 
He takes a few steps and touches the ground. It feels cool. There's an underground spring here. He begins to dig. The ground is getting wet. Water starts seeping out of the soil. The wanderer fills his empty bottles. Things don't look that bad anymore. It's getting a bit more difficult to breathe with each new day. In the past, phytoplankton and algae produced up to 70% of all the oxygen on the planet. But not anymore. Several days have passed. The wanderer runs out of water and food again. Fortunately, not for long. He's now walking among huge sunken ships. He sees modern aircraft carriers, liners, and even ancient pirate boats. In the distance, he spots huge mountains. The tops of these rocks are what used to be called the shore. The ocean floor is ending. The thoughts about reuniting with his family give him more strength. The man reaches the top and finds himself in the middle of a ruined city. It's empty. Where have all the people gone? Where is my family now? The wanderer asks himself. The man walks through the abandoned streets and meets an old man. He says that almost all the people who used to live here left the city and went to Antarctica. The wanderer has a new goal. He's going to get to the icy mainland no matter what. He will find his family. <laughs>